This PowerPoint is going to cover Chapter 10, Part 2, and we're going to be talking about the special senses. Please refer to your Chapter 10 study guide for this information. Uh, there's a considerable amount of this information that we won't, I won't be requiring you guys to know for testing purposes. Uh, so please kind of look over those learning objectives and the vocabulary, and that should help you know what you need to study from the second part of this chapter. Now, when we talk about special senses, uh, we talked last time about somatosensory, but now we're going to move into senses uh, that the receptors have become a little bit more specialized and unique. The oldest of those senses is going to be olfaction. So olfaction really covers both smell and taste, and we use olfactory pathways to uh, bring these senses or these, transduce these these signals um, and have the brain the brain perceive these senses. Now, why is olfaction one of the oldest? Well, chemotaxis in early cells, you know, cells being able to you know, distinguish where certain compounds, chemicals were found was important. And as organisms evolved and became more and more complex, there was still this need to be able to detect you know, food sources, um, be able to communicate, um, with other organisms via olfactants. And so this is, this is a really important um, sensory pathway for survival in organisms. So we use olfaction to discriminate amongst millions and millions of different odors. And these pathways are such to where we have uh, sensory neurons embedded in our olfactory epithelials in our, in our nasal passages. These sensory neurons will then pass through um, the skull, right, to the olfactory bulb, which is really just an extension of the forebrain. And from that olfactory bulb, we'll move down, uh, we'll synapse onto secondary neurons that lead to the olfactory tract that move us to the olfactory cortex. And then we have, um, from there, we can go on ascending, ascending pathways to other regions in the cerebral cortex, or we can utilize the limbic system in which we now make associations between these odorants, these smells, and um, areas of the brain that trigger memory and emotion. Okay, so we make that link between smell, memory, and emotion. That's why uh, odorants can be a really powerful stimulus for the brain. How do we convert that, that olfactory signal? Uh, well, an odorant is a compound that can bind to an odorant receptor, and these, these receptors then when we bind the compound, they're coupled um, with the G-protein-linked membrane receptor. You don't need to know the receptor itself, but know that that then opens, uh, uh, it, it, it triggers a um, intracellular pathway that then leads to an inter a signaling a neurotransmitter release that causes action potentials along this pathway. So that's smell. Gustation is the sense of taste, and it's very similar to smell uh, in that on our tongue, we have these, these taste buds that are found on the dorsal surface of our tongue. If we look at the, the taste bud, we'll see um, they start with a taste pour, and then inside we have these, these structures that are made up of three different types of cells. Um, we have receptor 1, type 1 cells. These are support cells, similar to like a glial cell. Um, we have type 2 receptor cells and a type 3 receptor cell. These receptor cells, depending on which get activated, they give us what we call our five basic taste sensations. So we can taste compounds that are sweet. Um, we have the sensation of umami, which is uh, triggered by um, the, the amino acid glutamate, and it kind of gives us that that delicious, um, that satisfying, rich flavoring. Uh, we can detect bitter, sour, and then salty. So type 2 receptors, those, those um, can taste you know, the sweet, umami, and bitter. A type 3 is sour, and then the type 1 is what we associate with salty. Again, all of these are found in the taste bub, all, all of these receptors. The difference between these um, 
well, really type two and type three is, is how the signal transduction kind of occurs. So let's look at that. In a type two, uh, we have an odorant, whether it's, or sorry, a tastant in this case, whether it's sweet, umami, or bitter, it's gonna be a ligand compound and it'll bind to a receptor. When it binds to that receptor, it's again, it's G protein coupled and it's gonna activate a protein called Gustu, uh, it's a G-coupled protein, and it's going to activate a protein called gustucin. And gustucin, once it's activated, that causes calcium to be released from vessels inside the cell, it opens calcium channels outside the cell, and so we have this intracellular increase in calcium concentrations, which triggers the production and release of ATP through channels. So ATP becomes the neurotransmitter released from our type 2 receptors. Okay, that ATP then causes the primary gustatory neurons to fire and we have the same. Now in the case of type 3, this is associated with sour, right? Um, sour doesn't bind a ligand. Instead, it's it's the hydrogen ions associated with that that acidic um, com that acidic food that we're eating, right? So the increase in in hydrogen, the change in pH, will be able to pass through hydrogen channels. And as we increase hydrogen concentrations inside the cell, that brings calcium into the cell. It triggers exocytosis of a synaptic vesicle, and now we release serotonin from the type two, and that triggers the release. Okay, type one is associated with, um, with sodium entering in through channels. Again, that's why they're salt, the salt, sodium enters in, and that, that kind of triggers the release and the, the sensation associated with that. Okay, so that's how we transduce just an odorant or a taste int into a smell, um, or in this case, into a taste that then gets perceived in the brain. So you're responsible for knowing that the five different senses, which you know types of receptors get triggered by which sets, and um, this transduction pathway. Now, if we talk about the ear, the ear is associated with two senses, um, hearing and also equilibrium balance. Uh, let's start first with kind of breaking down how the ear is, is anatomically set up. So there's three main regions of the ear. We have the external ear that's made up of the earlobe called the pina and the ear canal. And the function of the external ear is to uh, focus sound waves into the ear canal. Uh, then we have the middle ear. And what separates the middle ear from the external ear is the tympanic membrane. So this membrane, you can kind of think about it like a drum. Um, the sound waves will vibrate on the tympanic membrane and that vibration is then conducted by three bones found in the middle ear, the malus, the incus, and the stapes. So we conduct that vibration through these bones, okay, and then those vibrations get, um, get sent through what we call the oval window. So it's again kind of like another little drum sit, um, membrane and that moves us into the inner ear. So inside the inner ear there's two main structures. One is um, what we call the vestibular apparatus. So uh, this is going to be associated with equilibrium. The vestibular apparatus, the semicircular canals. Um, the cochlea is going to be is going to be associated with hearing. Okay, so we'll move in through the round, um, or sorry, through the oval window, uh, move through the cochlea, and then exit. Those sound waves will exit through the round window and um, dissipate again in the middle ear. And from the middle ear, we also have the eustachian tube that leads to the pharynx, so we can have drainage if fluid um, builds up in the middle ear. So what is hearing exactly? Well, it's, it's a perception of energy carried in sound waves. And a sound wave um, is going to uh, then be interpreted by the brain as an actual pitch, and frequency. So sound waves themselves, have, um, if you think about it, it's an energy, it's an energy wave, right? And it can be, it has a couple unique 
uh, it has a couple of unique parameters to it. One is amplitude, so how high the wave is, and the, the other is the wavelength, how far apart the wavelengths are. Um, the wavelength distance is going to give us what we call frequency. Um, and frequency then gets translated into pitch by the brain. So what pitch it is depends on how far apart the wavelengths are. We measure that by um, the hertz. Okay, that's measured in hertz. Now, the amplitude is going to dictate how loud we hear that particular wavelength. So the higher the amplitude, the, more, the louder it will be, and we measure that in decibels. So the transduction of these energy waves found in the sound wave into the sound that the brain perceives, that transducer occurs in these hair cells of the cochlea. So let's go through sound transmission. I've kind of already hit this a little bit, but let's just follow it again. Here's these steps. Okay, so the sound waves, they move and they hit the tympanic membrane. They're then going to vibrate and be conducted through the middle ear bones. Um, they will, the stapes is attached to the oval window and those vibrations then move into the cochlea. And inside the cochlea, we have these fluid filled membranes. Okay, so we have endolymph that fills this, and then we have what's called a tectoral membrane um, that then gets associated with another membrane called um, the basal membrane. So in the basal membrane, we have our hair cells. So as this wave, sound wave then moves through the fluid, it's going to push on these flexible membranes, and it's going to bend these hair cells. And as they bend, that opens ion channels, those ion channels depolarize and release neurotransmitters. Those neurotransmitters then create action potentials that move along the, the cochlear nerve to the brain. And then that ener the energy wave that was moving through the cochlear is going to exit through that round wave, or sorry, the round window and be dissipated. If we look at these hair cells themselves, so here is a hair cell. You'll notice that it has these. Uh, cilia, we call these stereocilia, and they increase in size, right? So we have a long one and a small one. Um, and they're joined to each other by protein bridges. Okay, so what that means is if one bends, it's going to pull all of them. They'll all bend. At rest, about 10% of the ion channels found in this hair cell are actually open. So this is a tonic neuron. We're sending a tonic signal all the time. Um, unless it's being inhibited, right? But that's why, you know, sometimes you get that ringing in your, your ears. Uh, really, that's just the brain um, perceiving this tonic signal. When a sound wave pushes down on the tectorial membrane and it comes in contact with the hair cell, it's going to bend these stereocilla. And as the stereocilla get, bends, or get bent, that opens up ion channels some more. Ion channels open. Generally, it's potassium and calcium that's going to enter these things, and that's going to increase the frequency of action potentials because we're going to release even more neurotransmitters, right? So more action potentials um, occur. Once that bending kind of stops, we'll start to return back to that tonic level, okay? Uh, if we bend the hair cell the opposite direction, okay, we can actually close and hyperpolarize the cell. So we close all the ion channels, and we get no action potential. So we can actually stop that signal. So this, by the, the frequency of these action potentials, we can then be sending signals to the brain. And we have these hair cells all along our cochlear membrane. So that leads us to this processing that then occurs. So the basal membrane um, is how we code for pitch. So I told you we have different frequencies, these wavelengths you know, are different in size. We can hear frequencies all the way up to about 2,000 hertz. And what we see is that low frequencies are able to travel further into the cochlea, and it's more flexible at this region. And so we, we activate hair cells further down. Whereas where we have higher frequencies, we're activating hair cells 
closer to the oval window on this basal or membrane. Uh, so that, that functions like pitch. You can kind of think about it like a piano in the sense that your piano, you know, on one end of the, of the uh, keyboard is the low keys. And as you start moving closer and closer or, you know, down to the other end, you get the higher pitch um, pair. So depending on which ones get triggered, that'll tell the brain, hey, it's probably this pitch. Uh, and again, loudness is a function of the number of action potentials. So if we have a, a higher amplitude, it's going to push harder on those hair cells in these different regions based off the wavelength, and we'll get a louder sound. We then conduct these sounds along this pathway that leads from each cochlea. So again, we have two ears, right and left, right? So we move on... Um, our cochlear branch of the vestibular cochlear nerve, so the nerve eight. In the medulla, we then cross and we will send uh, signals to both sides of the brain. So information from the right gets sent to the right auditory cortex and the left co auditory cortex. Likewise, the left cochlea is sending information to both the right auditory cortex and the left. So we go to the medulla, then to um, the superior um, olivary nucleus, then we go into the inferior colicus found in the midbrain, right? The thalamus, and then into the, the auditory cortex. Okay, um, in order for us to localize where sound source is, we need information from both sides. So again, you can imagine that if, if something is closer to the right side of our head, this is going to pick up on those sound waves before the left side. So we'll be sending a signal pattern to the right side and left side, you know, the, the right signal pattern will be a little bit before the left side will. And so the brain will perceive, hey, the sound is probably coming from our right. What, what does that cause? Well, you'll start turning your head. As you turn, that lag in those, those patterns becomes less and less until when you're directly facing at them, they're pretty much coming in at the exact same time. So that's how we're able to localize and direct ourselves on sound. What can cause us to lose our, our hearing? Well, that can happen either because of mechanical damage or neural damage. Uh, conductive hearing loss is, occurs when we're not able to transmit sound waves through either the external or middle ear. So if we destroy the tympanic membrane, um, if you have, um, you know, that'll re result in conductive hearing loss. Central hearing loss is now where we have the neural pathway between the ear and the cerebral cortex gets damaged. So if we actually have neural degradation in our cranial nerve eight, um, that can lead to what we call central hearing loss. Uh, a lot of times people are born and aren't able to hear. It's because of a central hearing loss and that pathway not fully developing during embryonic development. That can be solved in, in a couple of different ways, cochlear implants, things like that um, sometimes. Uh, and then we can have what we call sensorial, uh, sensorial neural hearing loss, in which the damage is, you know, we have structures in the inner ear that actually damage. The, the cochlea doesn't, isn't formed correctly. Or the hair cells themselves, over time, uh, they'll start to be destroyed. Uh, if you listen to lots of really loud, you know, music or you're around loud machinery all the time, that can cause um, destruction to the inner ear and to those hair cells. The other half of the ear, again, is associated with equilibrium. And this takes place in the semicircular canals and in the vestibular apparatus. So this is going to give us information about movement and position of the head. So as we move from the vestibular apparatus into the semicircular canals, what we have is we have these, these series of, of fluid-filled chambers. Some of these chambers are associated with what we call otolith organs. So we have two, we have the saccula and uticle. Inside these, what we find is we have this, these hair cells that are associated with the otolith organ, and we have this membrane, and then we have otoliths themselves. These otoliths are really small crystals that move in response to gravity and gravitational force. So what the uh, macula, is associated with. So the, um, the maculae is the hair cells, the otolith membrane, and then these calcium carbonate crystals that forms. Um, and we have these in, you know, the 
saccule and the uticle both have the maculae, right? Um, this will tell us if our head is in a neutral position, then the, these calcium carbonate crystals kind of sit, you know, just and don't really move the hair cells. But if we then have acceleration, so if you tilt your head back, right, that acceleration force, just that small movement, it's going to cause those otoliths to move on that otolith membrane and stretch those hair cells, um, just like they do in the cochlea, right? And that tells the head, like, look, look you know, we are accelerating. That's how we get that acceleration sensation is coming from the macula and our otoliths. In the, vest, the semicircular canals, this gives us information about uh, how our head is oriented, whether we're turning right, turning left. Um, and this is established by regions associated with each one of these three semicircular canals, so the superior, the horizontal, and the posterior. And we have these regions that are called cristae, in which we have a um, sensory cells, hair cells, um, and these this organ structure called the cupula. And you can think about the cupula, again, it's kind of like a brush moving across a board. If we pull the brush to the, to the right, then the bristles get pulled to the, you know, get dragged to the left. And so as that endolymph moves in this canal, it's going to push those hair cells either to the right or to the left. Right, so it's going to bend them, and the way this works. So you have these three canals. Um, the superior canal, it's going to sense rotation of the head um, from front to back. So if you're nodding yes, you're moving endolymph along the superior canal, and the, and the position of your head, whether you're back or forward, is being um, associated with that um, yes. Now, if you if you nod your head really hard, up and back, up and back, really fast you'll start to kind of get a little bit nauseous. That's because, again, those otoliths moving in the macula. The horizontal canal, um, if you're shaking your head no, right? So someone asks you a question, you shake your head no. Again, um, this is giving you that um, sensation is being detected here of which direction your head is. Again, you do this really fast, right? you kind of start to get nauseous. Again, that's also the otolus being shifted because of those gravitational forces um, and the cupula also being a strong signaler as well. Finally, in the horizontal, uh, sorry, not the horizontal, the posterior canal, um, this is if you're tilting your head. So if you tilt your head from shoulder to shoulder, that left to right, um, that's being detected by the posterior canal. So all of these send that information via what we call the vestibular branch of the vest. So we have the cochlear branch and the vestibular branch of our vestibular cochlear nerve. That goes into um, the cerebellum, into the, uh, the medulla, thalamus, and cerebral cortex, and we perceive that um, those sensations that way. Which brings us to the eye and vision. So this is the last special sense we'll talk about. This takes up quite a bit of uh, space in the chapter, uh, but I have distilled this down into just the essentials that I really kind of want you to know. So vision is how the brain perceives light that's been reflect reflected from objects in its environment. So we, we have a light wave that gets reflected off an object enters the eye and then gets translated into a mental image that we then perceive. Uh, the process by which this happens occurs in three steps. The first step is that is the light actually entering into the eye and the lens has to focus that light so that it reaches the right precise spot on the retina to be perceived and to signal to, uh, to trigger those sensory receptors. The second step is going to then occur as the photoreceptors of the retina take that, that light energy and convert it into an electrical signal. And then finally, that signal will, path, will, will then be transmitted along neural pathways from the retina to the brain process um, processes that will then take it and incorporate those electrical signals into the visual perception that we see. So let's start with the pathways for vision. Uh, what does this pathway look like? So 
as I just went through, uh, light is going to enter into the eye and it'll become focused by the lens. That focus, the focusing of the lens will move the focal point onto the retina where we then have the sensory receptors of rods and cones that'll be excited and trigger an action potential that gets carried first along the optic nerve. Uh, we will then send that information across the optic chasm to where it goes to both sides of the brain. Um, and it'll proceed along the optic track into the thalamus. And from the thalamus, it'll then be transmitted um, to both the midbrain uh, to coordinate, so eye movement, and to the visual cortex where that perception of the image will take place. Now, what gets directed from the midbrain is what we call the pupillary reflex. And it's a, a consensual reflex that occurs in which we, based off the light that enters into the eye, we will then constrict the smooth muscles around that uh, lens to adjust the focal point. Uh, and this reflex occurs without our perception and it's one of the you know the pathways that gets that gets uh, monitored by medical physicians when they suspect that perhaps there has been damage uh, to this pathway somewhere in the brain. So let's say you're playing a sport, you get an injury, and you have a head collision, and you suspect a concussion. What that you when you go into the emergency room or your attending physician, uh, the first thing they're going to do is take a light source. So they'll take their pen light. They're going to shine it into your eye. And what they're looking for is this pupillary reflex. What should happen is first, when they shine that light into the eye, the lens has not yet adjusted. So you're first going to get a, a bright flash of light. That's going to get transmitted to the midbrain. And the midbrain is going to say, hey, look, the focal point is off. We need to adjust the lens. And so it sends a signal back to adjust the lens to bring that focal point into where you can actually adjust and reduce the amount of light that's entering in. So the lens and the uh, pupil are going to be adjusted. The pupil is going to is going to, uh, in that case, with a lot of light coming, it's going to constrict to minimize the amount of light that can pass through because too much, it's overpowering. So what the physician is looking for, he shines the light in, and he's looking for those pupils to become smaller, to constrict. Right. Uh, if he doesn't see that, that tells him, hey, something in this pathway isn't working. Um, so someone who has a concussion generally will have dilated pupils. They'll stay wide even when you shine a light into them. That's a pretty good signal of, hey, the brain has suffered an injury. The visual cortex and the midbrain aren't functioning how they, they should, and we should uh, further investigate to make sure something more serious isn't going on. Now, I used some of these terms in my previous discussion about... Uh, what was going on with those those focal points? So let's let's talk about that. When we describe the light behavior and properties as they uh, associated with the eye, what we're really talking about is the the field of optics. And there's a few things in optics that we need to be familiar with. One is the focal point. This is the point where light rays converge. So if we look right here, you see light coming into the eye. Uh, the lens then converges them onto a spot this spot would be the focal point. Okay, the focal length is going to be the distance from the center of the lens to the focal point. So again, if we come here, here's our focal length. Here's the lens to that point. That's the focal length. As light enters the eye, it gets refracted. It's going to be bent. And it's bent at first the cornea, which is the outer protectant of, of the eye, and, and then at the lens. And the lens itself can be modified to have the focal point land on the retina uh, in the appropriate spot. So we can see that with these what we call ciliary muscles. Uh, when we shine, when light comes in, it's going to hit the cornea, it's going to become diffracted a little bit, and then it'll hit the lens and become diffracted even more. And what the eye is trying to do is it's trying to adjust that focal point to be directly on the back of the retina on the macula. That's where that's where it wants that focal point to be. And so if we look at 
it, when we have that set, the light comes in, it gets bent by the lens, it ends up here. But let's say we move the object closer. So we move it closer to the lens, but we don't change the shape of the lens. Well, what's going to happen is now it's going to get bent, but the focal point is going to be behind the retina, meaning what's being detected here would be blurry. We're not going to have it in focus. So to adjust that, the lens needs to be uh, rounded. We need to increase the amount of, of refraction that's occurring. And in order for that to occur, we use the ciliary muscle. So this ciliary muscle, when it's relaxed, then the lens is pretty flat. When it contracts, when this muscle contracts, it, it bulges up and causes all these ligaments to become loose. And so the lens actually, instead of being stretched and flattened right here, it becomes more rounded. And that then changes the focal length. So we can see we bring the appropriate focal point, we have the appropriate, appropriate focal length now that we've changed the lens. So that all occurs by our ciliary muscle. Uh, that process is called accommodation. That's the eye adjusting its lens shape to keep those objects in focus. Uh, there's, there's now disorders that can uh, actually cause accommodation to not be possible. Um, two of those are myopia and hyperopia, uh, nearsightedness and farsightedness. And then we can also have things like uh, presbyopia in which you have loss of accommodation in the actual muscles themselves that they don't function right. Or you can have astigmatism in which um, you have a misshapen cornea, so your lens is fine, you don't have a, the shape of the eye isn't, isn't um, what's causing the myopia or hyperopia, but rather that the, the cornea is a little bit misshapen and that causes distorted images. So let's look at these real quick. So here's hyperopia, farsightedness. Um, again, you'll, you'll see because of the shape of the eye, um, the eye is actually a little bit you know, more round, a little bit like, it's kind of like squished, right? Instead of stretched. And so that causes the uh, focal point not to be able to be brought appropriately um, to this to this region, the eye just can't it can't shape the lens. It can't get the lens to bring the the focal point here. And so, in order to fix that, you have to have like wear glasses or contact lens, in which you use a convex lens to further refract the light and, and curve it in, so that you can get the appropriate focal length. Myopia would be the opposite, in which you can't stretch the eye out far enough. Um, you can't bring it back in to, to get the appropriate thing. So instead, you'd have to use a concave lens to kind of bend it out a little bit and then bring it in so you get the appropriate spot. In photo, in, in photo transduction, we take light waves and photons and we transduce them into electrical signals. And that occurs at the retina. So all light energy is part of our, our is part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, the visible spectrum of that light extends from uh, roughly our um, 700 nano, uh, nanometers, which would be our reds, all the way down to the, the 400, which is down at the violet end of the spectrum. And that phototransduction photo converts that energy into electrical signals, uh, the, and then sends those signals down the the uh, the photo pathways to the brain, right? Those photoreceptors are rods and cones. But in addition to rods and cones, we also have what's called pigment epithelium. So these are the cells around the rods and cones. And what these do is they actually absorb any light that escapes the photoreceptors. So it prevents light from bouncing around inside the retina, which would give us distorted, blurred vision. So light gets absorbed and not reflected. The spot on the retina that gives us the most acute vision, where we have the most photoreceptors and where the visual field is most precise, is where the focal point is being put, occurs at what we call the fovea. Uh, the fovea is the point on the macula that gives us this spot. Okay, once the photoreceptors get excited, they're going to send that, that electrical signal to uh, what's called a bipolar cell that then passes it to another 
another cell, a ganglionic cell. And then the ganglion cells, they make up our optic nerves. And the point at which they leave the eye is called the optic disc. And we have a blind spot there. So we have what we call convergence occurring here. We're going from lots of photoreceptors to a handful of bipolar cells to maybe a single ganglionic cell. And that gives us our visual field. So again, you can see these things here. Uh, here's the macula region of the retina where we have most of our rods and cones. Um, here is the fovea, that's the precise spot in which we bring in our light. Uh, you can see that we have rods, right, are here. We have the cones. The cones provide us our color vision. The rods is our, kind of our, our night vision, our light and dark. And here you can see this convergence that occurs. So this is just showing rods, but it would be the same with, with um, cones as well. So you see how we have lots of rods and they converge on, say, here two bipolar cells, and those two bipolar cells converge on a single ganglionic cell. The receptors themselves, lots of information in the book. Let's keep this simple. Two types, cones and rods. Rods function in low light and they're used for night vision. They use rhodopsin. Um, that's the molecule that is utilized to become excited and uh, trigger their neurotransmitter release. Uh, cones, this gives us our what we call our high acuity vision. So this really gives high definition vision and that's our color vision. Cones contain three different pigments. So while we just have rhodopsin over here, we have three pigments and they get excited by red, green, and blue light. Now I talked about how we have this convergence coming from our, our visual uh, photoreceptors down to a ganglionic cell. And this is very similar. They create what's called a visual field, which is very similar to a receptive field when we talked about our somatic sensory like touch. Uh, we now know that vision is largely perceived by the brain, um, not by the presence of light, but the contrast of light. And that's due to these visual fields. So we have two types of visual fields. We have what are called on center, off surround. So if we look at the visual cells, these are all of the um, different visual fields. This, this makes up a single, um, you know, I, I, this is a, a group of photoreceptors. They form the visual field of one ganglionic cell. So this is a single visual cell. These would be all the photoreceptors. And you see if the photoreceptors in the center are being activated, but on the outside of the surround, they're not, then that's going to trigger the ganglion to send a strong signal to the brain. Okay, you could also have the inverse of that, what we call off center, on surround in which the bright light is triggering the outside receptors, but we don't have it in the inside. When this happens, again, um, we would excite the ganglion and send that signal to the brain. But in both of these scenarios, you see it's the contrast. What happens if we just have diffuse light that's both on center and on surround? Well, in that case, the ganglion, it just responds really weakly. We don't send a lot of action potentials at all. And so that tells us that, that how the brain perceives vision and, and takes data and puts it together is really off the contrast. We need contrast with our rods or cones in order to be able to um, send those action potentials and those signals. So we utilize both on, on center off surround visual fields and off center on surround visual fields to, to send that information. The last part that I want you guys to be aware of and, and to kind of um, follow up on is, is how we utilize um, binocular vision and that we project that to the visual cortex. So if this is our right eye, we're going to send some of that signal, right, is going to be sent over to the left, some is going to be sent over to the right, and you, you'll see from the from the, the centers that it goes from. So this part, the part that's going ultimately over to um, the right region of the brain is gonna be that that was perceived on the left, the left visual field. The part that's brought over 
to the right side of the brain is, is or sorry, the left side of the brain is that was perceived on the right visual field. We have that cross that occurs. But we take both of those sets of images, and so both sides will get that field of vision. So we're getting this part over here and this part from that eye. This part comes from the uh, left eye. This part is coming from the left um, from the uh, right eye. So that field of vision, everything on the right side gets processed over on the left side of the brain, and vice versa. For everything on the left side, gets processed over on the right side of the brain. What that means is like if you are looking at something, if you close one of your eyes and you look at something on the outside of your, your vision, um, it, it really is only, you're not going to get that 3D depth to it because we get that by combining both sides of the brain. This gives us our binoculars up where both the left and right fields have visual overlap. And so this is where we have really precise vision. Now we still have that peripheral vision. We can see to the outside, um, but there's not depth in that vision like we have here.